everybody wants to get started now. Everybody can take a seat. That's going to be amazing. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning at Figma headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, looks like we have about 150 people in the room. Thank you so much for coming out. And I think on the stream we have about uh, 1,000 people tuning in live. So wherever you're watching from today, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, I think everyone here is excited about Figma plugins? Yeah! Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us for our announcement today. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit more about uh, the project and what some of the goals of the project were. And uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for joining today. Um, I'm Tom Lowry. I'm a designer advocate at Figma. I'll be your MC for today. And um, we're going to hear from Dylan and Show, who will tell you a little bit more about some of the goals of the project and what some of our thinking behind how we approach plugins. And uh, then we're going to hear from uh, five different of our most active beta participants who have built Figma plugins that are some of which are available today uh, to use in Figma, and some of which um, are actually private plugins that they've built to help with their own internal workflows um, at their company. So uh, lots of exciting stuff lined up. And before we get started, I thought I'd share just a quick anecdote from my own experience. Um, before I ever discovered Figma, plugins were always like a really interesting part of my own workflow, uh, but it always seemed sort of like an impossibility to actually, as a designer, go through and build my own plugin uh, to help you know, something very specific to my workflow. And um, yeah, that always just seemed like an impossibility. And then fast forward to uh, when we started launching our internal alpha of plugins, um, I, you know, I read on a Slack message somewhere that we wanted to make this approachable that anyone that knows basic web development languages could actually have a shot at building a plugin. And like, a light bulb went off for me saying, like, maybe I could do this. And then very quickly, I went down this like rabbit hole of building Figma plugins, and it was way easier than I could have ever imagined. So I hope you all today will get a chance to like try some Figma plugins, uh, but also don't be intimidated by the process of building one, because I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome up uh, Dylan, CEO and co-founder of Figma, to kick things off. Thank you, Tom. Hi everybody, I'm Dylan, and CEO and co-founder of Figma. Thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, this is just like absolutely incredible to see the amount of support and excitement around plugins. Um, first and foremost, I really want to thank everyone who has built plugins as part of the beta. Uh, it's been insane the past six weeks, uh, and we wouldn't be here today without the support of the community and everyone who has actually contributed and spent the time to really dig in, give feedback, and also uh, be patient with us as we work through the issues and bugs with this release. Um, I'm going to give a special thanks to everyone on this list, but especially our five presenters today. We have Tiffany, Jackie, and Eugene from Microsoft, Etong from Coinbase, and Chris from Remix. Uh, let's give them a round of applause really fast. Uh, we're going to be shortly and show off their hard work. And uh, I think you know, when we started Figma back in 2012, I, uh, I, I could not have imagined that we would have companies like Microsoft and Coinbase and Remix and like amazing companies like this building on top of the Figma platform. Um, and so this is, this is really a dream come through true for a team and I. And um, I, I just, uh, I think our vision back then um, and today is to make design accessible to all. And uh, as I think about plugins and hopefully what we, you know, uh, our goal is to enable anyone to be able to build a Figma plugin. Um, if you're a designer who knows basic JavaScript, uh, HTML, you should be able to build a, build a Figma plugin. And so I'm excited to see what all of you do and what all of you create. Uh, I hope that you leave here with the energy and excitement to go build something. Uh, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to show. Show. Uh, so uh, uh, I am a product 
manager here. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we were thinking about when we built plugins. Um, obviously, we care about security, stability, performance. Without those, you know, you just don't have a platform. But uh, one of the things that we had to think about is what does it mean to have plugins for a design tools on the web? Because that's not something that's really existed before. And uh, here's this easy to build easy admin, but I want to go a little bit more into what I mean by that. So I think there's an opportunity with plugins for plugins to be something that anybody can build uh, in a way that really wasn't possible before. Um, I've worked on a lot of tools with plugin architectures, and you're always having to figure out, well, how do I uh, you know, uh, construct an API that people can understand, and how do I you know, get that code into the binary and onto my desktop and all this stuff? And you just don't have to think about that stuff. Uh, ideally, uh, on the web. And so I just wanted to show you just a little bit about uh, what it's like. So, what do I do this week? All right, so this is Figma, right? And all right, so here's the JavaScript console. If you've ever programmed on the web, you probably have seen one of these before. Uh, so, I'm going to just type in Figma. Uh, okay, and you'll see a bunch of stuff here. So what we've done here is we've exposed the internal document structure of Figma just like it was the DOM, right? So um, let me just type in Figma. Let's do current page. And this shows you the page node, which is the, the it's like the body tag. And gosh, this is a lot harder to use the mouse on this big screen than I think. All right, so here is children. If I expand that out, you see all the nodes. Oh, I don't have any nodes. Let me draw some. Okay. Let me do that again. Okay, page node. And here is children. Okay, there's a, there's a child in here. If I look at that, I see it's a rectangle. If I look at that, I see it has a bunch of properties. So, like, you know, you can imagine that it's basically like programming in HTML and JavaScript, except instead of looking at HTML elements, you're looking at rectangles and vectors and so on. And I'm just going to do one last thing real quick just to show you what uh, this is like. So I'm going to take that last thing and I'm going to change one of its properties. So uh, I just typed in figma.current page.selection of 0.x plus, plus equals, let's do 100. No, oh, syntax error. Okay, anyway, uh, I'm not going to debug my syntax error. You get it. But the idea is that like manipulating these things is super, super easy. I think anybody who can program on the web can do it. So that's that's the deal there. All right. Okay. And then how do I get back in the this stuff again? Cool. All right. And then. I put easy admin here. Uh, what I really mean by this is one of the things about Figma that makes Figma Figma is that when everybody uh, sees a document, they're all looking at the same thing. And with plugins, there's this weird thing where, well, I don't know if this person has a plugin installed and so on and so on. And so we wanted to sort of solve that problem as well. And the way we do that is that plugins are always live just like everything else. And uh, installing a plugin uh, means that you're getting the live version of the plugin, the same version that everybody else sees. And it actually freaked me out the first time that I, I tried this. Uh, when as soon as they got the plugin uh, installation mechanism working, I hit the install button, and then it just it just said installed instantly without anything happening. And I thought it was a bug. It's like, oh my gosh, like this isn't working. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that it is working. And if you think about it a little bit, like all it's doing is it's sending a bit in the server saying, okay, now it's installed, and then nothing else is happening, right? There's no downloads or anything like that. But the beauty of this is that when you have a team now, you can reliably make sure that every other team who needs the plugin has the plugin. They have the same version of the plugin. There's not going to be any incompatibility between people like messing things up because they have the wrong version, et cetera, et cetera. So those are two things that are like part of the web that we wanted to bring into the world of plugins. Okay, this is what it looks like. Uh, go check it out. Uh, I have a URL at the end, but you can hit if you haven't seen this already. But uh, you can see that uh, you can navigate and you know find all your uh, uh, Plugins through uh, an area at the top, which is like you know featured plugins that we change every week. Uh, there's a section at the bottom here. This is for if you're on the orgs plan, uh, you can distribute private plugins to your organization. And so that this is like a big company called Acme, and this is the plugins that they have privately within their organization. 
Um, there's a bunch of categories of plugins that uh, you're going to find. Uh, I'm not going to go through these all, but you can read. Uh, uh, let's see here. And then I just wanted to point out a couple of my favorite plugins before passing it on to uh, to our presenters. This one's called uh, Similarities by David William. Uh, it, it's sort of like a super powered find similar things. Uh, you can uh, filter by all sorts of different uh, criteria, which is pretty cool. Uh, this one is uh, something that lets you insert uh, content from the Now project, which I think is pretty cool. Just the idea of people sharing uh, content through uh, Creative Commons uh, and, and having that live right inside of Figma, I think is really neat. And this last one, Image Palette by Matt Delorier. Uh, this is just one of many uh, plugins that this person has written. Uh, he's uh, already shared a bunch on Twitter, and they're all really cool, but this one, uh, extracts color palettes from images. And then with that, I just want to leave you with, if you haven't already checked it out, uh, you can find all the plugins to install at figma.com slash plugins. And if you want to get started with creating plugins, go to figma.com slash developers, and that will tell you everything you need to know. All right, thank you, Shil. Uh So now we're going to kick off uh, our first presenter, Chris. And he's going to tell you about one of the plugins that he created. Everybody, welcome, Chris. Also, a quick request for everyone who's talking, speak directly into the microphone for everyone in the live stream. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good turnout today. Pretty cool. Um, so my name's Chris, and I'm a designer, and I'm super excited to show you my first Figma plugin today. So I'm just going to get right into it here. Uh, I want to talk about maps. Does anyone here like maps at all? Yeah. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> so I work with maps a lot in my design work. Uh, so a couple of different contexts. So my day job, I work at a company called Remix, and we make uh, tools for cities to plan transportation. So a lot of maps involve the map work. Uh, I'm also on the board of a nonprofit called the Market Street Railway, and we advocate for the historic streetcar service in San Francisco. And I worked with them this year on a web app that lets you track the streetcars uh, on Market Street near Barcadero and see which ones are near you, some fun stuff like that. And that is pretty much uh, a map entirely as well. But uh, sometimes working with maps and your design mockups can be a bit frustrating or tedious, uh, can kind of like take you out of your workflow. What I mean by that is kind of you start in Figma, you're making a mockup, you're like, okay, I need to pull a map in. So, I'm going to go to my browser, I'm going to open up my map service, in this case for me it's Mapbox. I'm going to take a screenshot, come back to Figma, paste it in, and doing that over and over again, kind of frustrating, means I'm spending time dealing with that instead of solving problems for people. So that's why I made a plugin, it's called Mapsical. Um, I was about half an hour before the deadline for submitting my plugin, and I was like, oh crap, I don't have a name, uh, so I came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> And my goal here is to kind of take that longer workflow and just make it uh, one step. You are in Figma, you open up a plugin, and you've got a map. And so with that, I'm going to go switch to a demo, and we're going to check out how it works. All right, so I'm going to show a real example in a minute, but first I'm just going to show you some of the basics. So I just have an empty screen here, and let's say I want to open a map here in this rectangle. Um, there's a few ways I can open it. I can go to the plugins menu in Figma. I can also just right click any um, component, any node in Figma. And I can go here and open up Mapsicle. And now I have a Mapbox map here. And it's an interactive map. So the first thing I want to do is really just find the right spot for the map I want. Maybe I want to focus kind of where we are today. I can also search. And it'll take me to any place I need instantly. And because this is uh, based on Mapbox, we also have a ton of different styles we can use. So there's some built-in ones like uh, the light style and the dark style that are really awesome for data viz. There's these beautiful satellite maps you can pull in. And some default styles. You can also, um, if you make your own map, maps in Mapbox Studio, you can bring those in uh, as custom styles. I'm just going to make a, a dark map here. And the few things I can customize too, I can change the size, make it a bigger map, smaller map. I can change the pitch if I want to go 3D, just do fun stuff like that. I'll make a, a basic map right now. So it just does its thing, and now I have a map. And 
part of me, uh, part of this for me was making sure that if I need to go change a map, I can do that really easily. So sometimes I want to change the style, play around with different visuals, sometimes I want to change the content or where the map is. Uh, and I can just go back and open up Mapical, and it'll actually bring me back just to where I was before, and I can make any changes that I need to super quickly. All right, so now that we've seen some of the basic stuff, I'm going to try it out in a real example, and we'll kind of see how it works when you're actually making some designs. So I'm going to go to this app that uh, I talked about for the nonprofit. This is actually an app. Uh, it really exists. Uh, my girlfriend and I made it together, and it's called Streetcar.Live, and it, uh, like I mentioned, shows you like where the different streetcars and San Francisco are, which ones are coming to you. Um, and so looks like an app, but I'm kind of missing something, uh, which is a map. These guys are kind of like floating out, and it's kind of sad. So I'm going to go take this map area, and I'm going to go open up. Uh, oh. <laughs> Hi, Philip. <laughs> so I'm going to go and just open up Mapsicle here and maybe say I want my map that's kind of like around here. And now I have a map in my mock-up. Cool. Now, this is a map. It works. But there are some things that are not really ideal for um, the app I'm working on. So for example, I don't really need some of the detail, like the freeways here, because we're taking transit. And I um, also want to actually see the transit lines that, are, um, that these streetcars are running on. And so I actually have a custom style that I made in Mapbox. So what I'm going to do is um, pull that in now. So, So I'm going to come back here, and the first thing I want to do is make sure that I'm authenticated with my Mapbox account. So I'm just going to go ahead and enter my access token for me. And the next thing I want to do is actually get the URL for my map style. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to go add custom style. And right now I can just paste in that map style, and Mapsicle will pull that in just like that. What? And so now. <laughs> And so now I have, instead of that kind of more like car-based map, I have one that's for transit and showing the uh, transit lines that I want. So I'm just going to go ahead and update that. And we're good. And of course, when you're designing an app, there's not usually just one screen. There's usually multiple steps in your app that you want to mock up to show the full story of what you're making. And so let's say, for example, that I want, um, when I click on a streetcar, to kind of zoom in on it and show more detail around that part of the map. So I'm going to copy my map over, and I'm going to come back to Mapsicle and say I want to zoom in, and I'll just kind of zoom in, maybe say I want to go around here, and that looks pretty good. And I have the kind of second part of my mock-up here, so super quick. And now lastly, in addition to having all these different steps of our app we want to show, we also want to make sure we're designing for different breakpoints. And this is not just an app for mobile, because it's a web app. Anyone can open it on any device. So I want to make sure that it looks um, nice and it's usable at a large size as well. Um, and now, normally, I might just try to like take this map, and I might try to, I don't know, just kind of stick it in here and resize it and see what happens. Now, there's kind of a problem here, which is that instead of getting more map, which is what I want, I'm getting like a lot of like blurry text and everything's getting bigger and now like the text on the map is bigger than everything else in my mock-up. Now I've added in a really quick way to fix this, which is that you go to Mapsicle and instead of click the refresh selected map option, what that'll do is just kind of take your same map settings, reload it with whatever size you've chosen. So I'll do that really quick. It'll do its thing. And now I have a I have more map. Cool. And that's pretty much it. Um, just want to um, say thank you to everyone for checking that out. And if you have any ideas, suggestions, want to tell me how you're using it, uh, want to send me a picture of your cat, please uh, <laughs> email me. Um, I just want to give a big shout out to the Figma team for making it super easy to make a plugin. Um, most of my development experience is web. I'm a designer. And so it was like 
basically just a couple weekends I spent building this, which is really awesome. Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Amy at Mapbox for her support in all this. And that's it. Thank you all. <laughs>
took me like 30 seconds, and that's because I'm like just tilted sideways from the screen. But, <laughs> um, but it, it's pretty fast. Um, and I think at some point you realize that like, oh, okay, well, um, let's change the flow a little bit, right? Like, what if we introduce something like a um, instant buying uh, button? So now you have uh, a button here, let's just pretend that's like a button, make it blue to make it more realistic. Um, and then now you can suddenly skip the confirm purchase step, and then you can go to the successfully successful uh, screen. So you can kind of just do this, and if your line is about to get drawn over another canvas or another frame, it'll just notice it and just skip over that frame and try to wire itself around um, to connect to the right place. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna have back here. So that's it. So you end up with a lot of things like this, where it's like pretty quick to tell people who are stakeholders but not designers, what's up. Um, you can annotate your lines, uh, mix with complicated flows, pretty easy. Uh, and up next, uh, we're going to be working on uh, arrow text, so you can show people which directions uh, lines are going. Uh, maybe they're conditionals, maybe they're happy pads, sad pads. Um, you're going to be able to connect shapes in and out of frames, so clicking a button to a frame. And then even nicer lines that make better assumptions about where you want to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Up next, we've got Tiffany. Hi, everyone. I'm Tiffany, and I'm from Microsoft. So today I'm here to talk about some of the plugins work that we've actually been doing in the accessibility space at Microsoft. Now, in the context of the product development process, you can imagine that this is a very simplified, zoomed out version of what that product development process might look like. We tend to think of accessibility more as an afterthought, so something that gets tacked on towards the end of the process. And the implication of that is we get this thing called the accessibility tax, where what seemed really straightforward at first in designing and creating experiences becomes super circuitous and super redundant. And this accessibility tax has a lot of different implications for us, right? So not only are we wasting a lot of time trying to fix and catch all of these accessibility bugs, we're also losing a lot of money by getting sued when we don't catch the accessibility bugs. Um, and a lot of the work that we would want to prioritize also gets deprioritized when we have to move people over to work on these other things. But I think the most important thing is when we think about accessibility at the end, what's actually happening is we're not serving the needs of a lot of our customers with varying capabilities. So our hypothesis is that to get around this problem, it's pretty simple, we just need to start thinking about accessibility earlier in the process. And so for us, because we're designers, how can we think about accessibility in the design process? And more importantly, how can we actually create the tools to empower our designers to do accessibility well? <laughs> cool, so um, show of hands, because I actually am very curious, how many of you guys know what tab order is or focus order? Oh, awesome, that's great. <laughs> Much more than I expected. So for the people out there who don't know what it is, I can just give you a very quick overview. So if I am not a cursor using user, so maybe I'm a keyboard navigating user, the way that I would navigate through an experience is I would press the tab button and the shift tab button to navigate through different focused elements. And normally as a designer, the way that I would do this is maybe I have some stickers and I can start to drag them over and I can say like, well, if a person was navigating through this web page, first they tap here, then they go here, and then maybe they go here. And then you start running into all of these things where you say, oh wait, no, I actually want to reorder this. Like, this should come first. So I have to move everything over, and you see how it gets really tedious very quickly, especially with a lot of different tab stops. So this first plugin that we created is called Focus Order. And then I'll pull it open. I'll try and do this and talk at the same time. But basically what I can now do is I can multi-select a lot of these different design objects that I want to annotate. It'll automatically add them along with their name and but in the back end it's attaching the node ID and everything uh, to the Figma pane, which I can then start dragging around to change the order. And everything automatically remembers for me. 
So that's pretty cool. But then I think also as designers, a lot of times we're wondering, well, how does this actually feel? I want to walk through this and see if this makes sense. So one of the other things we've done is we actually allow you the option to tab through the book in order to simulate whether or not this is logical. In addition, all of these annotations are actually grouped in a single annotation layer that you can toggle on and off. So sometimes I don't want to be documenting for accessibility. I want to work on my designs again. Um, but let's say that I found, oh, actually, this should be moved out a few pixels, and maybe I don't want this box right here. My plugin will actually automatically update a lot of the annotations. So that's pretty cool. Um, but let's say, and that was, that's how we can accelerate the accessibility process for a single designer, but how can we actually accelerate the process of collaborating on accessibility and annotating for accessibility? So let's say that someone else made these annotations. I actually made these, I think, yesterday on a different computer. But let's say that I was a PM and I came in and I had some assumptions about the way that accessibility should be annotated. Um, and maybe this isn't the right order that I want. So what I can do is I can select this layer and load it in to my pane, and I can just start making edits to something that someone else already made, which is pretty fun. And I think the last bit that I'll mention here is the way that this is working on the back end is we're actually attaching all of the accessibility tab index metadata to these different design components. So once we start making plugins that will port all of our designs into production code, a lot of that accessibility metadata that normally developers have to put in will actually already be there for them, so they don't even have to think about that accessibility burden for them. So that was the focus order annotator that I made. Some of the other things we've created, I think Jackie's going to show this later, um, is we've created a color contrast checker that will check for all accessible text within a frame. It'll also allow you to change that text in real time to see how the color contrast ratio changes. And then another plugin that we're working on that hopefully will be out in the near future is creating a plugin to annotate for screen readers, which is something that I don't think exists in the market right now. So really what we're trying to make is this plugin suite for accessibility that will serve the needs for our designers at Microsoft, but also eventually, we're hoping, will be open sourced to the broader design community. So yeah, let us know what you're interested in, if you find this useful, what you want to see. Thanks. <laughs>
and a very creative designer come up with the name company to put it in the template. And also he used company.com as a URL placeholder. And guess what? The engineering team implemented everything as is. So they literally took that domain name, company.com, put it in the template. And after a product was shipped, and it was popular at that time, so imagine like thousands, thousands of hundreds of organizations across the globe were using those templates to create websites. And of course, people changed the company name to something they needed, but they didn't know that they have to change the URL. So when all these websites were published, so the main owner of company.com at that time, like because Microsoft didn't own it, one day he just woke up and like, oh wait a minute, there's a lot of traffic on my park domain. I have to convert it into a profit. So uh, it was a long story. Microsoft had to put what put up with years of uh, extremely uh, extremely public customer backslashes. And it's simply because we didn't pay attention to a simple content that we deliver to our customers. So at Microsoft, it's quite challenging for designers to find and bring approved content into their design. So sometimes it's just like tedious and requires a lot of browsing through special hidden resource uh, on corp map internal resources to find those trains and make sure that they can use them in all designs. So this is how well, we design content real plugin for Figma as a one-stop shopping for all your content needs. So currently it has a variety of text types, such names, first and last names, and three different languages, uh, phone numbers, US addresses, currency, etc. Also we support photos and it's limited to avatar images only, but we're planning to add more categories later. Uh, also, we have one uh, set of icons, which is currently limited to Microsoft Sega MDL asset sets, but it has more than 1,500 uh, UI-specific assets. Uh, the interaction with the plugin is very simple and straightforward. So you, you basically um, select one or multiple text layers, and then you apply content you want. And every time you press the apply button or press the content type, it will generate uh, a random list every time. So some, some plugins or some, some content types, they have custom mode where you can just like uh, pick a different um, variation of the content or pick a different formatting. You can choose currency, you can choose language, you can apply all sorts of things. And we have a little preview tab or panel that shows you what the content would look like. So for, for the icons, you basically can scroll through the list of icons, or you can search for a specific one, you can always hover over to see what the name of the icon is. Uh, and uh, you got to keep in mind that this is a glyph-based approach. So like this set is a, basically a font, and you have to download and install a font in Figma in order to use those. So there's a copyright notice. So in the public version, we're not releasing any Microsoft internal content. So instead, we're pull pulling data from a website called randomuser.me. Uh, it has pretty much all content types as free to use, uh, including images. Um, and make sure you read the EULA user agreement before you use those images in your design. Um, so what's coming next? So we're very excited to add more functionality to a plugin. So basically, more data types will come later. So we will add more languages. We'll add more data types. Uh, we also want to introduce layer smart support uh, select. So where you can just select one layer that will automatically find similar layers for you to update. So personalization and custom lists. If you have specific list types or list uh, list that you want to share within the team, it also will be available there. Um, component support, you select the master component, press a button, and it will update all the instances and generate nice looking lists. And uh, my favorite one, live web data support. So basically you open websites, you click different images or different uh, nodes on the page, and the plugin will suck them in and bring them into design and keep them live and keep them updated every time you refresh a page. 
So uh, please send your ideas and feedback to our email or join community online. Thank you. Thank you so much. Up next, we've got Jackie from Microsoft. Um, he's going to get set up on his personal device. And uh, Jackie's like the OG Figma plugin creator before Figma plugins were Figma plugins. And uh, so, yeah, he's going to take it away and show you some internal tooling that they've built as private plugins at Microsoft. Hi everyone, my name is Jackie. Um, I'm a designer on the Power Platform team at Microsoft. And um, I've been building plugins and tools uh, in the past year or so, and it's kind of become my passion. And the reason why I build plugins is because I realized that designers today spend a lot of time on tedious and repetitive tasks instead of um, spending more time to be creative. So, I'm hoping that with uh, the help of plugins, we can actually automate these tasks and then to kind of get back some of that creative time that we need uh, on our day. I have uh, quite a number of plugins to show today, so I'm going to just go rapid fire and demo up as many plugins as uh, I can in <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> All right, here we go. So um, here I have a page uh, full of uh, mobile screens, and the first task that I want to do is I want to change my carrier from Sprint to AT&T, and I want to do that for every single screen uh, on this page. So with the Find and Replace plugin, I can search for Sprint, and then I can cycle through every instance of that word uh, on this page and replace it with AT. Hit replace all. <laughs> Next, um, I'd like to replace this pretty image uh, with another image I found on Google. So let's try this one. If I can go ahead and right click and copy this image. And then, um, pro tip you can actually search for plugin names. Um, in the hamburger menu, so I'm going to search for the paste image to fill plugin, hit command V, and the image is replaced. Um, the third task that I'm um, going to do is I'm, I'm going to replace this uh, text uh, on this button to something longer. So instead of join today, let's try something like uh, join today and uh, get a free t-shirt, something like that. So instead of manually dragging to try to get the, um, the, the width to, to align to a single line, I can simply use the button resizer, button resizer plugin, and it will resize it for me with the same paddings. Next, um, I'd like to check for accessibility issues. So I want to see if the color contrast ratio here uh, passes the AAA uh, requirements. I can do that by selecting the frame, and then uh, do a contrast check. And then you can see that all the uh, illegible, inaccessible texts are highlighted. I can hover over to see more information like the contrast ratio. Uh, whether it passes AA or AAA, um, and then I can click to fix the problem. So I see these three pieces of text are not very legible, so let's make them a little darker. And then I'm going to try checking again from the last plugin, and they're all pa uh, they're all past uh, AAA color contrast requirements. All right, so now that I'm done with my screens, what I'd like to do is export this uh, page as a PDF to my PM, because PMs love PDFs. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to, because I work in Microsoft, 
Uh, my PMs love PowerPoint. So <laughs> I'm going to export to PowerPoint. I can give it a name. Art Museum app is fine. Hit download. There I have it. Oh. <laughs> uh, moving on, this is a plugin um, that I built for Microsoft. And so these are components from our WebFluent uh, library. And the challenge here is that not every single Microsoft product uses this blue color theme. So I created this plugin called uh, Fluent Theme Switcher, where I can quickly swap out the different color themes for a single layer. So this really allows us to use the one single component library um, on uh, multiple different product teams. Um, another thing that I'd like to show is, uh, oh, I actually don't like this green, let's change it back to blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the ability to add URL links to components. So what I can do here is, so say this uh, toggle button, I want to add a URL to the component to my documentation page, and then set it. So whenever I drop this component into a screen, I can view the documentation, and it's going to launch that documentation site with all the do's and don'ts and best practices. <laughs> For the next one, I'd like to build a table um, with real data. So um, here in Excel, I have a bunch of sample data uh, in a form of table. I'm going to go ahead and save this as a CSV file. And then in Figma, I'm going to search for my table builder plugin. I can drag and drop my CSV, click Create, and it's going to create this fully responsive um, table for me. In <laughs> And all of these are components, so you can just you know, swap them out for different variants um, using the instance dropdown. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to say thank you with an animated gift. And this is a thank you to everyone and the Figma team for supporting us to build all these plugins. Hopefully it animates. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jackie. That was amazing. And that's our last presentation for today. Uh, we're going to have, for those of you who are in the room, we're going to have um, some demos that are going on in the back. Stick around uh, to meet others who are here. And also, there is a poster at the back that we'd love all of you to sign. Uh, to sit and like just sign your name for coming here today to join us for the launch. And we can't wait to see what you build. Um, send us your ideas as you get a chance to play around with the Figma plugin API. And thanks everybody for joining us here in the room and online. <laughs>